and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. We continue to come to you live from Davos 2024. And joining me now is the elusive Richard Premji, who only always sits down with us here in Davos. It's great to have you back for our annual chat. And I spend quality time with you here, Shireen. You know, once I, a year, is I, more I, than I, enough of you, I'm sure, for you as well. So. Well, you know, Richard, I remember very clearly when we last spoke here in Davos, you said uh, that you had come in expecting a far more somber mood. Yeah. Uh, and it was uncertain, but not as uncertain as you were expecting it to be. Um, how do you feel about that uh, this time around? No, you know, I think I said you know, going into a somber environment. Look, it's been a tough year. The environment has been uncertain for tech services in general. I think it's been a bit harder uh, for us as well. I, we have a larger consulting business, a larger discretionary pool. But, you know, as I go into 2024, I'm feeling a lot better than I was feeling when I go into 2023. Mm. Uh, we've come in at the high end of our guidance last quarter, and that was just a reflection of strong in-quarter execution and strong sort of uh, activity from customers during the quarter, typically a slow, quiet December quarter. Uh, I look at our consulting business and I look at the order booking from uh, last quarter and it feels much stronger. So I'm going in with cautious optimism. I don't want That's to declare... That's what you said in 2023 as well. No, but I'm going with, you know, I see some green shoots okay. of, of, of things sort of moving uh, perhaps positively. And so I'm looking forward to... I, I hope 2024 being a better year In than 2023. In some specific areas, uh, the green shoots that you're seeing? No, I mean, discretionary spend, right. which is always a, you know, always a key indicator of how momentum happens. I see early signs of that. Consulting to me is a great spend, a discretionary spend area, and I see that early signs. And then I'm quite hopeful about you know, what happens with AI and how the mm. spend there moves, and I'm sure we'll talk about that as well. Because I find one of the things that is changing, Shireen, is last year customers spent a lot of time experimenting, mm. POCing, we must have done somewhere between 80 and 100 POCs. And I think this year, customers are spending a little bit more time about thinking about real business impact uh, as they go into 2024. I, I will talk to you about AI and what, uh, of course, Wipro has been doing on that front over the past two years. And I know that we spoke about this briefly. Uh, but let's address the environment at this point in time. And, uh, you know, when we last spoke, you said that you were feeling excited and confident about the fact that you had a leadership team in place that you believed could deliver the goods. Yeah. Uh, you're still playing catch up with your peers at this point in time. Yeah. Of course, you've done, uh, delivered a, a good quarter and the markets have rewarded that as yeah. well. How confident do you feel about the ability of this leadership team yeah. to deliver the goods today? No, I feel supremely confident, Shireen. I think we're doing the right things. We're on a journey of change. We have a strong, stable leadership team and an organization of, that is transforming and doing different things, you're always going to have some people that come in and out. And so that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't uh, uh, destabilize us. And we're incredibly excited and incredibly strong with uh, the team we have and the team we believe in very, very clearly. An alignment between the execution strategy of the management as well as the vision of the promoters? Absolutely. There's full alignment between the journey we're on and the journey we're going on. And so the uh, don't believe otherwise. The report suggesting that there is misalignment? I, I, all I can tell you, Shireen, is that uh, our CEO and our team has our full support. Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, so, Richard, let's talk about now the road ahead. And you talked about some of the transformative things that have worked for you. What more can we expect on that front? What would you like to see change or what are you trying to do differently to ensure that the growth momentum picks up from here on? No, so look, let me talk about the environment. The environment is still uncertain. And there are lots and lots of elements dif definitely playing out. It's still a fragile economy. I think the U.S. is looking a little bit better. Europe, for me, is still uncertain. So you have a fragile economy. You have 60 countries going into election mode, which creates mm. its own level of uncertainty. You have a political, geo political conflict. You have a war that's still playing out. And then you have this whole element of AI, which I think could be a huge opportunity for growth, but also the clarity on governance yeah. and how that plays out. So in the backdrop of this uncertainty, I think there's also opportunities. And the opportunities are clearly in tech spend becoming more and more integral and central mm. to customers, customers recognizing that they need to continue to invest. And so I'm still very hopeful that the areas of cloud, the areas of data and AI, because there is no good AI without solid, structured, mm. safe, secure data, 
the whole areas of engineering, the whole areas of cybersecurity are areas where we're investing in, the areas where I feel we are differentiating in, and we've got to execute and deliver as but, we move into 2024. But in the near term, and I'm, you know, this is on the back of the commentary that I'm picking up from some of your peers as well, is there a sense that the, the large transformative kind of deals are perhaps going to be on pause for a while longer, while it's more the sort of cost takeout efficiency deals that will continue to drive I would, growth? I would agree with that, Shireen. I think certainly the focus, if you look at larger deals, is more on consolidation, on cost. Uh, but I think there are pockets of spend that perhaps can emerge and will hopefully emerge as we move more and more into the year, on which you can ca count as arguably discretionary, which I think can create uh -huh. potentially some more momentum as you move into the second half of 2024. So this, do you anticipate a situation of a pent-up demand? Once, what, is, is there a general sense of risk aversion and once that were to abate if there was to be some sort of certainty on some of these fronts that we spoke of that you could see the spends pick up? I don't know and I don't want to make you know predictions yeah. that are just uh, uncertain. Uh, as I said, I am hopeful and I see early green shoots. And I want to, you know, they're early green shoots and that's what they are. There's nothing more than that. Yes, well, you're, you're underlying that yes. clearly. But let's talk about the generative AI opportunity. And uh, you've been working on this at Wipro for over two years yeah. now. Uh, you know, which direction do you see yourself taking internally? Yeah. And what do you believe it, it's going to do externally in terms of growth for you? Yeah. So let me talk about it from three angles. Yeah. One is the investment we are making, Shireen. The other is what we are doing to ourselves as an enterprise. And two, the opportunities, three, the opportunities we see externally. One is we've called out formally last year something called AI360, which is our billion dollar investment over the next three years into AI, where we are very purposefully infusing AI in our thinking and everything mm. that we touch with a very, very strong governance angle overlaying it, right? And it's not going to be sort of buying your way into spending a billion dollars. It's going to be very pervasive. One of the big things we're doing is we're training uh, employee base. We've trained 209,000 of roughly 240, 250,000 mm. people. And, <coughs> excuse me, we're training them on 101 stuff, so they're not going to become technical experts on AI. Yeah. But what it's doing is it's infusing, uh, by the way, with a very strong governance mindset as well, but it's infusing the thinking of AI across the organization. So an associate, a business analyst that's working on things can think about the opportunities he or she has to leverage AI to do their job better, to be 20% more productive, mm. to have 20% more time to do other things with their time as well. Uh, so there's a mindset of leveraging AI all pervasively with the organization. And then we're in enforcing it and infusing it in different elements of our organization. For HR, for example, you know, we're in using it for background verification. Mm. Any employee today has access to what we call we now a chatbot. We've had 4.7 million queries on this chatbot, around 40 functions with 98% accuracy. And I'll give you an example. I personally use this, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll go into the system and say apply for leave on January 29th. And I don't have to talk to my assistant or talk to somebody else. The system does it. Or I can reach out and say, look, find me form 16 from year 2018, mm -hmm. 19. Mm -hmm. I'm not clicking through 10, 15 screens, going through different applications. We have 40 functions or use cases today that will build to 100, 150. And mm -hmm. 4.7 million is a staggering number. We're using it for content generation mm. on marketing. We're using it to enable us to do a better job, a faster job of responding to RFIs uh, for, for sales pitches, right. right? So there's a pervasive mindset mm. of leveraging AI within the company. And then I find with customers, I, I would say there are two broad yeah. tracks that are unfolding. One is around everything experience, mm. you know, chat, contractual completions, uh, helping in transactions. How do you infuse AI to differentiate products? Right. right. So a whole mindset of customer service, contact mm. centers, driving that pervasively. As I said, it's largely been on POC mode. I think it has opportunities to scale. Mm. The others in productivity. How do you leverage it to drive code better? How do you leverage it to develop synthetic data better so you mm. can test faster, protect your data more impactfully? And all of this on the bedrock of a very strong mindset of safe, secure, transparent mm. data. Right. So I'll give you an example. We've just set up an AI governance uh, committee. Right. We have a chief security and AI data governance leader mm. in the company who reports to our general counsel. That team's job is to look at every use case that we look at mm. and look at it from a governance standpoint, from an individual assessment, from a social assessment, from a technical assessment, from an environmental assessment to make sure it's okay to go out. So 
Look, I'm excited, as you can tell, about the yeah, uh, I, I opportunity. Can, I can see but it's that. Early. It's early it days. It is early. It is early. Right. But what are the kinds of questions are asked that clients are asking when we talk about generative AI? Right. So as I was saying, everything around experience, mm. everything around productivity, those are the kinds. Let me give you a simple example. You know, a large healthcare customer has come to us and said, look, today we're struggling to provide great customer service to our key customers. Right. You know, I'm toggling through eight or nine or ten different applications to provide next best action, to yeah. provide high quality service. How can I leverage chatbots and generative AI to deliver that stuff more impactfully? A large telecom company has said, look, I have struggled moving data around. Mm. Can you generate synthetic data mm. so I can test uh, some of these products that I'm looking to launch? Those kinds of things. So, you know, what are we talking about? Three to five years before this starts to kick in in any meaningful fashion as far yeah. as revenue contribution yeah. is concerned? Look, if I knew, then, you know, <laughs> uh, we'd be having a different kind of conversation. But this, this boat has, has left the station. Is it going to have a mobile, kind, mobile first kind of journey? Is it going to have a cloud kind of journey? I don't know uh, the kind of acceleration that it will have. Let's also appreciate we're a year into yeah. this, this conversation, right? But I'm very hopeful that customers will look more and more at leveraging this uh, for real business impact faster than we anticipate. So do you, you, are you going to continue to invest in building Abs up these capabilities absolutely. within the organization? Absolutely. The other thing we will look at seriously is let's find areas where we can completely disrupt for ourselves. Mm. You know, can we do this with no people? Let's experiment in, in areas and even if that means that perhaps hurts some revenue in the short term, it creates a use case for what can be mm. in the long term. You know, when you talk about the use of AI and in the context of no people, I think that's one of the big fears as well, that what yeah. is it going to do? What will it displace? Where yeah. will it displace? You know, will it be no people or will it augment people? Yeah. How are you reading this and yeah. what it could mean potentially for an industry like yours, which is yeah. a massive, uh, you know, hire? Yeah. Look, I think you've got to think about this as an enhancer, an augmenter, an enabler, right? Uh, how do we convince employees that this could help them do their job better? So there's a whole change management exercise we have to take our employees along that this list makes you more productive and makes you more impactful and don't feel threatened by it, right? There will certainly be some jobs that will require complete reimagination and complete reskilling. Mm. And that's the job of us as, as companies, as industry, as government to help reskill people to make them more relevant for the future. So also providing that comfort that, look, we will help you. I think today, if a software developer can be 25% more productive, there's 25% more software they can develop because there's enough work to be done today. And so today, in the certainly for the, the, for the short term, I see this as an augmenter to what uh, employees can drive. And so people should really embrace this as opposed to resist it. You know, uh, since we are talking about people, uh, let's address what's happening across uh, industry today. Uh, and I want to address the issue of why Wipro's decided to sue Jatin Dalal. I mean, you know, been with the company for decades. Why the decision to, to do that? Yeah. So, so Shreen, I'm not going to get into a specific case, but let me just yeah. say the following comments, right? One is we are simply enforcing a standard industry contract that everybody sort of follows. We are not creating any prevention of employment or job opportunity for anybody, right? And we're simply ensuring that, you know, uh, that we've signed a contract and we want to ensure that we protect ourselves from, a, from an information standpoint along those lines. So I, I wouldn't read more into this. You know, I find sometimes there's a tendency to sensationalize this. Well, it's not sensationalizing. It is, I mean, it is it simply, it's an unusual, it's an unusual thing to we're, happen. We're simply enforcing contracts, which is not an unstandard thing. Mm. to do sure. but, but you know we're seeing a fair degree of senior level churn within industry yeah. uh, uh, you know a lot of folks here from Infosys who are now heading different corporations yeah. out on the promenade as well what do you make of the, the way that we're seeing these uh, these changes take place across industry no I think it's great opportunities for people it's a great sign for our industry that organizations are producing talent of the world-class talent and people are getting opportunities to run world-class companies. So I think it's it's something we should be proud of but is as that, companies and industries. But you know, given this war for talent, and you know, again, I know there's a lot of speculation around the fact that whether there are no poaching agreements in place, formally or informally. I mean, you know, it's against it's against the law. Well, what's what's the take on that? No, I didn't follow the question. You know, that whether there are indications coming in from some companies to the other saying look don't go after our people and so on and so forth I know I, I know this is all informal uh, at this point in time but are those conversations and I on? can't comment on speculation but look I think you know organizations sign contracts employees sign, con sign contracts and I think it's important that we respect those contracts and take them seriously I think that's not an unreasonable 
request or ask of both the employee as, as well as the employer. So, Rishad, you know, you've been somebody who has believed very strongly in advocating for things like mental health, uh, for advocating, uh, uh, you know, great experience at, at the workplace and so on and so forth. What, what are you now doing? What, is, what are you prioritizing with this, in, this AI era that we're dealing yeah. with? No, I'm certainly prioritizing people connecting in person. You know, we've, we want people to come back to the office. We have 60% of our people coming back today. Certainly connecting in person, I think, is incredibly important. <laughs> and I love the fact, Shireen, that things like, uh, like mental health are becoming important conversations, very central to the kind of uh, conversation we should be having. Mm. You know, just a sidebar, I was in Kochi a few weeks ago, and I visited some of the work we do with some of our uh, grant NGOs that we support. And there was one that was focused on mental health. And I loved what the person from this NGO said. She said, you know, they've set up a place for mental health within the primary health care center. Mm. So the conversation on physical health is happening in parallel with mental health. So they're not separated mm. from each other. And even the verbiage has changed from calling someone crazy to saying somebody has a mental ailment. And I'm talking about in the, in yeah. the more remote yeah. rural parts of the country. So I think it's an important conversation that comes to bear. You know, but <coughs> through the pandemic, uh, there was an expectation that perhaps uh, work from home, flexi hours, and so on and so forth, that these would be trends that would <coughs> stay. It doesn't seem to be the case anymore with companies saying you've got to be back at work in office. No, we've always believed in the hybrid model. We've mm. always said the hybrid model is here to stay. I'm still a huge believer in flexibility with connectivity. Right? So we've asked our people to come back three days a week and yet provide them flexibility for two days a week. Because I really believe... You know, people need to connect. They need to connect for innovation. They need mm. to connect for, for idea exchange. They need to connect for culture. One of the reasons I think it worked so well during COVID is because people knew each other. Mm. As organizations have getting, gotten bigger, as all of us have grown sizably in absolute terms over the last three years, there are many new colleagues you're engaging with, right? This conversation would have been different yeah. if we were doing it virtually. Right. It yeah. just would have been. Yeah, absolutely. Right? No, I, I completely agree. I'm, so, I'm glad we're not doing it virtually. virtually. But, you know, let me end by asking, Rishad, uh, the, the many changes that the organization has made are uh, starting to deliver the results. When do you feel uh, confident of being able to get to uh, where your peers are? Yeah. Look, I, I think we're doing the right things, Shireen. I'm confident that we are focusing on the right elements. Uh, we are putting our heads down and we're focusing on execution. And let our results do the talking as we move forward. That's the best way to sort of demonstrate it, I think. Rishad, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here in Davos. Appreciate your time and look, forward to, look forward to perhaps seeing you in India Hopefully. and not, not just here in Hopefully. Davos. Good. Thanks, thanks Good. very much always for joining us. With you, Lovely to see you. Lovely to see well, you. The more conversations will continue here on CNBC TV 18. We will be right back with you in a moment. Good.